Welcome everyone to the Al Wooten Jr. Parent Power Group. Uh, today we have Dr. Angela Parker, who's the Director of Training and Programs at the Genesis Center Los Angeles. But before we get started with Angela, I'm gonna give you a little uh, details about the, the Wooten Center. Uh, the Al Wooten Jr. Center is a nonprofit organized and uh, founded by Myrtle Frey Rump in 1990 in honor of her son killed in a drive-by shooting. The center provides free after-school and summer programs uh, for students in grades 3 to 12 in the Los Angeles area. The Parent Power Group are workshops presented in partnership with the Green Foundation and other donors which can be found at www.wootencenter.org donors. The message for the day in regards to COVID, LA County's road to recovery, reduce your risk of COVID-19 outside the home. Choose wisely, avoid the three C's, Combined spaces, crowds, close contact, close contact. The more C's, the higher the risk. Take steps to reduce your risk and plan ahead. Also, remember to take the measures to protect your loved ones. Wear masks, wash your hands often, avoid crowded spaces, avoid close contact. And right now, I would like to present Angela Parker. I've had the uh, pleasure of working with her on several projects. Uh, we worked together uh, with the Wooten Center. Uh, and also, she's invited me to some amazing uh, opportunities with her organization. And one of the great ones was a fancy um, dinner and art show uh, at the Annenberg uh, facility. I took my son, Travis, who he just, he got all dressed up. You could not tell him he was not, you know, the art connoisseur. So I want to thank uh, Angela and uh, let her turn, I'll turn it over to her right now. Thank you so much, Alberta. Um, I am Dr. Angela Parker. I am Director of Trainings and Programs at Genesee Center. And I was just curious um, if you're familiar with Genesee Center, um, just uh, do a little hand sign, like just so I know, kind of if you ever heard about us. Um, Let's go. Nobody? Okay, well, we are the oldest domestic violence intervention program in South Los Angeles. In October, um, in addition to being Breast Cancer Awareness Month, is also Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about Genesee so that you know that we're a resource in the community in case you know of anyone who may need us. And also, I'm going to talk a bit about um, domestic violence and, and what that looks like. So... So Genesee Center, as I mentioned, we are the oldest domestic violence individual program in South Los Angeles. We actually found it by five Black women who, um, they didn't intend to find a shelter. Like I always like to tell the story because I think it's just amazing about what we can do when we come together without even trying. Like they didn't intend to find um, to start a shelter. They were friends and they wanted to do good in their community. And so they decided that domestic violence was gonna be their issue because every one of them had been touched by domestic violence in some way. Oh, great, Angelique, you know about us, fantastic. And so um, they actually set up a hotline because they were thinking that what they would do was they would donate food, diapers, um, formula, different things like that, that kids who were going through DV might need. And then what they realized was that what women that were calling really needed was shelter. And this was like 1978. And there were very few domestic violence shelters and there were definitely no shelters in South LA for women and the traditional shelters were not really servicing black women. 
And so um, they decided, you know, they had no money, um, but they, they, they had a dream and they knew this and they had determination. And they decided that they were going to be a shelter. And two years later in 1980, um, we opened our first shelter. Um, our mission is to provide victims of domestic violence with a comprehensive centralized base of support that ensures they transition from crisis to self-sufficiency. So what does that mean? So that means we do more than just provide some place for somebody to live. Our goal is to make sure that when our clients come to our shelter, they receive all the programming and services they need to be self-sufficient. And we do that by programming um, pretty much everything in-house. Um, our philosophies are as follows. Um, we believe that domestic violence is a family issue and not just a personal issue, that it affects everyone, not just the victim, but everyone that the victim knows. Children and women are our primary clients. As a matter of fact, children are the majority of our clients because most of our clients come with two to three children. We really focus on providing culturally sensitive services, which means we understand that the majority of our clients are women of color, predominantly black women, with Latina women being the second. And we understand that oftentimes we process services different ways. We might have a, um, a distrust of social services, so we're not going to call the police because we don't want the police to come in and arrest our man or our woman. And we don't want social services to come in and take our kids. So we just have a different way of seeing things. So we're not necessarily gonna run off and get a restraining order. Um, we also understand that um, if we're not giving services, again, that helps our clients to be self-sufficient so that when they leave us, they can have a job, they can have a permanent place to live. They have the mental health um, that they need to move past the trauma. Then we really haven't done our job. Like we have to be more than just a temporary respite. We have to help them sort of transform their lives and kind of be the bridge to let that happen. We also understand that men have to be part of the conversation. So um, we are actually one of the only domestic violence intervention programs that have men clients. We also are one of the only domestic violence intervention programs that will house teenage boys. Most um, domestic violence shelters have a cutoff at the age of 12. But one of the things that we realized is that even if your child is, your son is six foot five, you're not gonna leave him in a dangerous situation. So we make sure that you're able to bring him in. We can also house large families. So if you know someone that has um, six or seven children, we are able to house them. Um, the majority of the shelters aren't able to do that, but because our, um, we have apartments that are two to three bedrooms, um, we are able to do that as well. Um, when I talk about our comprehensive service model, it, this is what I'm talking about. So we have a 24 hour hotline where anyone can call Mondays through Sunday. We always, we always answer it. When you come in to the shelter, you do what's called an intake. And then you're giving a case manager. So that's important because everybody starts from a different point, right? And what one of the things we never wanna do is we never wanna tell people what it is that they need to get better. Like we're your partner. And so we meet people where they're at and then together we will decide how it is that they define success. And so we talk about, you know, what kind of counseling do you need? What kind of legal services? What kind of health services? Um, vocational education, um, children's services. And we use all of that information that we gather to create a plan for them. And that also will decide how long they stay in the shelter because our clients can stay with us for up to two years. Um, again, these are just some of the programs that I talked about, and you can kind of briefly skim through them, our case management, um, vocational education. So one of the things that we really feel strongly about is that if we have clients who um, have all of this talent, we want to help nurture that talent and get them beyond just, you know, working sort of a job and move them towards this career. So we've partnered with different organizations, um, primarily the Vermont Slauson Business um, Center, and we work with our clients and we help them create business plans and get loans for small businesses. 
And since we started that, we've had about five businesses to come out of that. I'm a baking business, um, a virtual assistant business, um, a greeting card business, um, a jewelry business, um, cleaning services. Like oftentimes I know you're running to people who are doing all this stuff and they're like, oh, you know, I'm just hustling. But those hustling's actually marketable skills. And so we really work to try to let them know that and to help them channel that into something again that can help them be self-sufficient. Um, so for our emergency shelter, the clients come, they can stay anywhere between 30 to 45 days. It tends to be a communal living setting and um, they will have their case manager and will decide immediately what it is that they wanna do. Do they want to stay with us and go into transition? Because sometimes people have a place to go and they don't need to be with us. Um, do we need to help you relocate your child into a different school? We make sure that they go to the doctor. A lot of times, because clients have been in sort of a DV situation, they've neglected their health. Like we've literally had clients that haven't been, who haven't had a physical in years and discovered they had cancer. So, you know, it's really important that we get them to sort of thinking about themselves when they come in and get them um, kind of situated into sort of what, what now, right? So um, then they can come either into what we refer to as site A or site B, which is our two transitional housing apartments where they can stay up to two years. Now, what's great about these sites is that they are self-contained learning centers where clients can literally get everything they need to succeed where they live. And what I mean by that is we have on-site um, uh, case management. We actually have our own mental health department that works with the client. So we do individual children's and family counseling. We have children's centers where the kids can go and we do birthday parties and they can just relax and play. We have relaxation rooms for the moms. We have boutiques that also include a salon. And we do classes in there as well where they learn how to do their hair and their makeup and sort of how to dress for success for job interviews. We have classrooms that have computer labs, um, libraries, we do tutoring, homework sessions. Um, really anyone who comes to Genesee that wants to succeed, we will give you the tools to make sure that you are able to succeed. And this is really important because a lot of times, you know, people come to us with just the clothes on their back or oftentimes they have had a lifetime of abuse. It's not just this domestic violence relationship. Some people think, you know, with clients, you know, they, the abuse was like the worst thing that's happened to them. And then once they, we get them out of the abuse, then they'll, their life will be perfect. But that's not necessarily the case. Some of our clients, they come from foster care. So they've been bounced around. Some of our clients have been victims of sex trafficking. Some of our clients um, haven't uh, graduated um, the sixth grade. Some of our clients have PhDs, but they have been sheltered, so they don't really know how to function in the real world. You know, everybody comes to us sort of at different places, and what we want to do is we want to help them sort of, sort of fill that gap and make sure that they're able to, um, to have successful lives. And so Site B is our, our larger um, facilities, um, six two bedroom units and again, six three bedroom units. So that allows us to house large families. And again, very similar to like site A, classrooms, children's rooms, mental health rooms and, and different things like that. And I really like to show our sites because a lot of times people are really scared at the prospects of going into shelter. And I understand that. Like nobody wants to go into a shelter, nobody. But what we want, you want people to do is, you know, you don't have to stay in a situation that you're in because you don't want to leave your stuff, you know. Sometimes we tell our um, well-meaning, we'll tell people that we know who are going through this, you can't leave that house, you know, or your, or your things. Like, you work too hard for that, you know what I mean? And people are scared to start over. And we want to tell people, you know, you don't have to die over stuff. You can walk out of that house. You, you can leave everything behind. 
all right, and come to these beautiful facilities. You know, you're not going to be living like in some scary place, you know, with some cots where you don't want to take your children to. You're going to be in a space where you can heal and grow and thrive. And so we like to spread the word out because like the majority of you, you never even heard of Genesee and we've been around for 41 years. So we want people to know that there is a place that they can go and there is a place that they can go to get help. Um, we are one of the only domestic violence legal program that has a legal program. So we've been in Inglewood Superior Courthouse since 2001. We do free restraining orders and free court, court accompaniment. So that means that you can come to our clinic in the Inglewood Courthouse, get a restraining order, and we will help you through it. And I don't know if you guys have seen restraining orders, but they're, you know, they are really complicated for a lot of people. And why we're so proud to be in the Inglewood Courthouse is because the only other legal clinic is in the South Bay. So you can imagine how difficult that would be for people who, you know, may have trouble with transportation and just don't want to go that far. You know, they just would not get the restraining order that they need. And since um, we've been in there, we've done about um, 20,000 restraining orders and counting. So, and it's for the community, for anyone who needs it. Um, if you're a victim of um, intimate partner violence, if you are a victim of elderly abuse, um, maybe, you know, it's something going on with a friend or a relative, we will help you with your restraining order. We also have um, legal clinics that we do um, quarterly. So if you need help with landlord, tenant, if you need help with immigration, um, you can come to our quarterly clinics and we will help you free of charge. It's our Impact LA clinics and we will get you face-to-face -face time with actual attorneys from uh, legal um, organizations and law firms throughout LA. And we're talking about you know, some of the best ones in the city. And also, we take care of all of our clients' legal needs free of charge. So anything that they need, we are there. We have um, about five attorneys. We have about, I think, like six paralegals now. So, so our, legal, our legal program is really, really robust. Also, on our Children Enrichment Program, we believe that children are equal victims of domestic violence. And so one of the things that we want to do is we want to help our children um, get the mental health they need to cope with what they're going through, what they've seen, to kind of make sure that um, they're able to break the cycle of violence um, at a young age. But also, we want to make sure that they're able just to be kids and they're still able to have fun. And so we do a lot of different activities, including the summer camp that we do every year with the kids who live in the shelter. And then Generation J is actually our outreach and education component for you. Um, we work with elementary school, middle school, high school, and college and university students around the issues of healthy relationships and domestic violence. Um, we do peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, um, community service activities, advocacy, and healthy relationship workshops. So if you know of any youth who need community service hours and might be interested, let me know. Also, if you work for an organization with you, that you feel could benefit from us coming in and talking to them about healthy relationships. We would love to come in as well. Again, just let me know. We'd be more than happy to do that. All right, now I wanna ask you as we move into our um, education portion about domestic violence, what does a normal relationship look like? And you can, um, if you don't want to answer, you can put it in the chat. But um, anybody, what does a normal relationship look like? All right, in a partnership. All right, what kind of partnership, Alberta? I would say it's... Um something where both partners feel valued, feel empowered, uh, feel supportive, feel safe, 
um, and uh, just a comfortable, loving relationship. That's great. Um, Kat says love, honesty, loyalty. Elitist says respect and a good listener, right? So we're talking about, um, you know, feeling valued, um, knowing that you can trust the person, right? They're honest and loyal, um, feeling like you're respected and good listening, right? Which goes to communication. So these are all really good. Um, anybody else have anything that, that you want to add? Yeah, and working together for one common goal. Um, Charlotte, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, um, everything that Alberta said, but, you know, knowing what you both want, mm -hmm. you know, as a couple in life, and that means talking, you know, to each other mm -hmm. and, um, you know, knowing, you know, if, you know, you want a family, mm -hmm. what kind of life you want to build together. Mm -hmm and you both work towards that. So it's like when, you know, working together for one common goal, which is, you know, um, family and um, just making your, your both of your lives better. Um, yeah, and what I love about what you said is it really sort of gets to the heart of what is a healthy relationship, right? It's two people on the same page, right? Exactly. Working towards a lot of the same goals, mm -hmm. right? That, that's what makes something healthy and what makes something functional, right? And there's no power dynamic, right? Or, or I mean, you know, there's always going to be a little bit, but for the most part, okay. right? The majority of the time you're working as a team, so. All right, so the definition of domestic violence. So domestic violence is a range of behavior um, where someone establishes power and exerts control over another person. Um, are there any words in this definition that stick out to anyone? Establish power and exerts control. Exactly, right? Power and control. Yeah. So here's the thing about the relationships. Everybody's relationship is different, right? Um, what you might find acceptable in your relationship might not be something that somebody else finds acceptable in your relationship. But again, as, as um, Charlotte talked about earlier, as long as you're both on the same page, it's fine. What makes a relationship toxic is when the person is forced, the other person is forcing you to do something that you don't want to do. And the fear is that if you don't do it, you're going to suffer consequences, right? Physically or emotionally or financially, right? That is what makes something abusive. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. All right, so it's important to understand that uh, domestic violence is learned and not caused by genetics. And why do I say that? Because oftentimes people feel like only a certain type of person, right, could become a victim of domestic violence. Um, they're violent anyway, right? And pick whoever they is, right? Person of color, right? A man, right? Um, somebody from a, a, a lower socioeconomic status, right? It's sort of like um, they're preconditioned for this, so there's nothing that you can do about it, which is not true. People will mirror the behaviors that they see in their lives. And if you grew up in a domestic violence situation, um, oftentimes you'll tell yourself, when I get involved in a relationship, I will never be abused. But you tend to gravitate toward abusers because that's all you've seen growing up, right? Conversely, you'd be surprised how many people are abusers who grew up saying, I'm never going to abuse my partner because they saw what their parent was going through. But because that was the behavior that they saw mirrored in their house, it was almost sort of their go to, right? Is what they learned how to do. Um, also, understand too, it's a choice the um, abuser makes, and it's not caused by alcohol or drugs. So I hear so many people say, "Oh, you know, if it wasn't for if you know the the alcohol or the drugs or whatever." N no, not really. Now, we all know that drugs and alcohol will exacerbate one's behavior, right, and lower one's inhibitions, but it doesn't cause the abuse. I'm sure, you know, some of you have, you know 
had maybe too much to drink or you know somebody who has and they haven't become violent right and so you can't really blame drugs and alcohol for things like that also it's influenced by institutional and societal responses anybody want to take a guess on what that means Is it like what they see in the media or, you know, like what's going on, uh, you know, in movies or I don't know. Exactly. Right. <laughs> so if violence is socially acceptable, we're going to accept it. Right. So if we, you know, if we're looking at, you know, whatever TV show. Right. And, you know, we're throwing drinks at each other and there's a lot of violence and things associated with relationships. We start to think, Hey, that's just a normal part of relationships. And then people start to look at you crazy when you're like, mm, I don't think you should be doing that. And they're like, no, you know, what are you talking about? Like, this is just normal. This is just the way things are. You know, we tend to normalize dysfunctional behaviors. And then again, the last point, as we talked about earlier, is found in every level of society. So it doesn't matter um, what your race is. It doesn't matter what your sexual orientation is. It doesn't matter what your gender is. It doesn't matter what your social economic status are. Anybody can become a victim of domestic violence. And this is so, um, you would think that people would kind of understand that, but I can't tell you how many times someone um, has been killed or someone has been or has killed and I've heard I never thought they would be the type to be in a relationship or I can't believe so-and-so did that they never seemed like they were capable of that and that's one of the things you know you know I'm sure as everyone here on this call if we don't know somebody we know of somebody who has been a victim of domestic violence and it's just so prevalent in our society and a lot of times it doesn't look the way we think it's going to look. And we're going to talk a little bit about that later. All right, so here's a little bit of warning signs of domestic violence. Um, if you're with somebody that's policing your cell phone or your emails or your social medias, if they're controlling, um, if they seem to be extremely jealous and insecure, um, if they isolate you from your friends and your family, if they have erratic mood swings and explosive tempers, one minute they're just really, really happy and great, and the next minute, you know, it's just you didn't even say or do anything. If they are making false accusations and accusing you of doing things that you're not doing, and if they're um, using sexual manipulation and pressure, um, are there any things about um, these different kind of signs that maybe stand out to you when you're just looking at them? So a lot of times these behaviors in the beginning, they don't seem abusive, right? They seem romantic, right? Um, so I talk to people who, um, if they have a, a partner who's like always jealous, they think that's cute. Oh my God, they like me, you know, they like me so much, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, they're so jealous, they don't even like nobody else to look at me, like that's love kind of thing. Um, or if they're, if they're texting you to figure out where you are, or they just want to make sure that I'm okay. Or if they're isolating you from your friends or your family, oh, they just want to spend so much time with me. They just want me to myself. You know, I just think that's really cute, you know? And so for men and, and for women and for, for, for people who are um, gender non-conforming, these things in the beginning feel like love when you're swooped up, you know, in it, in, in the beginning. And it takes a while for you to kind of realize what it is that's going on. Um, Tyrese says, we always believe they'll change and it's like an addiction. Exactly, you're trying to kick. Thank you so much for that. Because the number one question that I'm, being, I, I'm always asked, and we're gonna talk about that later, is why doesn't the person leave, all right? And I can tell you, um, I've been doing this work for 16 years and I've never talked to anybody that was like, you know, we went out on the first day and it was great and then they punched me in the mouth. Like that never, ever, ever happened. Like when people get involved, 
in domestic violence situations, in the very beginning, things are fantastic, okay? This person that you're with is like the answer to your prayers, the person that you've been looking for all your life. They're love bombing you. Does anybody know what love bombing is? I don't know if you guys heard that term, but love bombing is when a person is just telling you everything that you ever wanted to hear. They're buying you gifts. Like they are just there for you, right? And you're just, it's like a romantic dream, like, you know, something out of a movie, right? And then slowly but surely, they start to kind of reveal themselves, right? That's kind of what love bombing is. And so what tends to happen is when by the when the abuse ends up happening, and oftentimes the abuse doesn't happen right away. It could be months down the line, years down the line, when you have all your time invested in it, you might even have a family, right? You're just trying to get, go back to when things were good, right? And that's all you want. And oftentimes, you know, you know that that's never going to happen because things were never really good. That was just a mask, okay, that the person was wearing sort of in order to get you. And abusers are very manipulative. I think sometimes we tend to have this fantasy, right, that abusers are sort of these out of control people and they're not. They are very in control and they know exactly what it is that they're doing. And not only have they charmed you, but they've charmed all your friends and all your family. And so when you go and you tell them, you know, oh, you know, um, you know, Jack is hitting me. Oh, no, not Jack. Jack is fantastic. Like, he's the best thing that ever happened to you. Like, are you sure you're not over exaggerating? You know, it's the gaslighting thing and you start to feel crazy, you know, after a while. So it's important to understand that, um, you know. It's just not that easy. And, and typically it takes a person up to seven times to leave a domestic violence situation before they're finally out for good. And again, one of that reasons is like Tyree says, you feel you, you just can't give up hope that the person is gonna change, right? All right, so the different types of domestic violence, there's the physical abuse, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, the hitting, the kitchen, the, the punching, the choking, um, the emotional abuse, which is the name calling, the belittling. Um, emotional abuse is something that is as equally, um, or some people might argue, more devastating than physical abuses because, you know, bruises will heal. But the emotional torment that people go through oftentimes will not only like uh, mess them up in a relationship that they are in, but they'll follow them into like the relationships to come. You know, when we're younger, like we used to say, I don't know if you guys used to say this, like sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. But that's not true. Words are incredibly hurtful, right? And a lot of times, our self-worth or the way we see ourselves are is based on how others see us, right? Right or wrong. And if somebody's tearing us down and telling us that we're nothing, you know, we start to believe that, that we're nothing. And we stop, um, you know, striving for what we deserve because we don't feel like we deserve anything. Also sexual abuse. So sexual abuse, of course, um, I see Tyree says, an abuser preys on your weakness, exactly. And what makes it so insidious is they're preying on the one thing that people really want, right? Which is love, right? Your weakness for love, your weakness for them, right? And your weakness, you know, maybe for the family that you never had or for some type of connection that, that you always wanted. You know, things that are supposed to like make you stronger, right? They turn it, they turn it into a weapon against you. Sexual abuse. So sexual abuse, of course, we all know is rape, but it's also any type of unwanted touching, right? It is forcing you into a sexual situation you don't want. So for example, maybe your partner wants to do a threesome, but you're not really into that. But you feel like, hey, if I don't do this, then they're going to leave me, right? And you don't want that, right? Um, forcing you to have sex, you know? Um, you know, I, I was talking to this guy, you know, he was a young guy in college and he, for religious reasons, um, he wanted to abstain from sex. And his girlfriend was like, well, you know, if you don't have sex with me, I'm going to break up with you. And he didn't want to break up. Right. And so it's one of those things where it's like, where he's being forced, feeling like he's being forced to do something he doesn't want to do. Um, birth control manipulation, right. When a person refuses to wear a condom, 
that of course will open you up to STIs and perhaps um, unwanted pregnancies. And pregnancies are a way that abusers also will use to hold on to their victims. Also, um, condom coercion. Has anybody heard of that condom coercion? Right. So that that's that's what I'm talking about. Um, when they refuse to wear a condom, even if you ask them to. And there's also this other thing called stealthing. Have you ever heard of stealthing? Anybody? So stealthing is when a person pretends to wear a condom, right? Or they'll put the condom on and then they'll take it off without you seeing it, right? And so you have agreed to consensually have sex with this person with the condom, but they've made the decision not to wear the condom. Um, also, so when you poke holes in the condom, right? Um, when women, if you lie about being on birth control, right? And you're not on birth control, you know, because you're trying to get pregnant, like all of those things are a type of, of sexual abuse. All right, digital abuse. So this is the big one. Like this is actually now because everybody lives their lives online. This is the fastest growing type of abuse. And what this is, is basically people keeping tabs on you through your social media, seeing where you are, through your IG or your Facebook page. Um, they can put little trackers on your phone to see where you are. Does everybody know that, that there's a GPS on your phone that somebody can activate? So you, you, you need to be very aware of that <laughs> and make sure you know that the tracking is not on. I mean, you, if you guys have kids, you want to have it on for your kids, but you don't want to have it on for you for somebody like to be tracking you. Um, also, um, there is all these dating sites now that are out, right? Tinder and different sites like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Alita, they, they can track you on your phone. Um, and a lot of times abusers will, or they'll, they'll, they'll download apps on your phone. That's why you have to, like, if somebody's asking you for your passwords and different things like that, um, sometimes they're doing that not only for them to be able to keep tabs on your texts and what you're doing, but to be able to install apps on your phone without your knowledge. Um, texting incessantly is also a form of digital abuse. Um, so you have to really be careful. I always tell people, you know, I, I know you want to share stuff. But um, sometimes it's not the best thing to go on your social media and to be like, I'm on the corner of 54th and Crenshaw and I'm going to be here for the next two hours, right? Because now somebody's stalking you, they know exactly where to go. I always encourage people, you know, don't always feel the need to post in real time. You know, sometimes you can post things, you know, afterwards, just to be real, just to be mindful of that. Also, um, again, people are being stalked. They're going using these social dating apps and people are being called what's catfished. Anybody heard of the term catfish? So that's when somebody misrepresents themselves, right? As somebody else. Anybody seen clickbait? Yeah, raise your hand. If, yeah, you seen clickbait guys? Yeah. So um, clickbait is basically one big horror story about catfishing gone wrong. <laughs> But, you know, you have to be really careful about who it is that you're talking to and meeting online because, um, you know, you could be talking to somebody who has created a whole fake persona and that's the type of abuse that's abusing, you know, your emotions, right? It's abusing you emotionally and making you think that there's a relationship going on that's not going on. Um, financial abuse. So um, when I talk about financial abuse, People think about sort of in, a, in, in an old school way, like um, the abuser is the breadwinner and um, they give the money, they use money to manipulate the person they're abusing. And, and that's still a big part of it. But sometimes, and I don't know if you guys know this, um, it'll be a situation where the person that's being abused, the victim will work and the abuser doesn't work, but they still demand their money, right? So they know that you get paid on the 15th and on the 30th and they know how much you get paid and you better up that money and they'll decide what, if anything, they'll give it to you. They might call your job incessantly, right? To see what it is that you're doing. Just try to sabotage your job, right? That, that's some type of control that abusers have as well. Um, if you've ever been in a situation with somebody who it's lunchtime, right? And they can't go and have lunch with other people, 
right? They have to sit at their desk and eat lunch or maybe call their partner or different things like that. That's also a type of abuse as well because they're not allowed to do that or to socialize with their coworkers. Another type of abuse is withholding um, affection due to money. Now this gets to be a little bit dicey, right? Because people feel like that's kind of part of the dating game, but not particularly true, right? So if you have a situation where you're like, hey, you're in a relationship with somebody, and you're like, hey, you know, um, I want to come over. And they're like, mm, you know, I got this gas bill that's due, you know, and um, and until you pay it, I don't want to see you. Or, oh, you know, I really want this person, this belt, you know, and if you don't go out and buy it for me, I don't want to see you, right? Those are all types of like financial abuse where, you, where you're using people for their, their finances and um, you're equating love and money together, right? If you don't give me this, I'm not gonna give you the love that you want. Mm-hmm. Um, spiritual abuse. So spiritual abuse, I think you, you probably heard about this. Um, typically, you know, we talk about it. It's when people's religion is used against them. Most likely their scriptures or their spiritual books. You know, we talk about how like, you know, the man is the head of the household and women are supposed to do kind of what they're told, which has been used kind of historically as an excuse for abuse. Um, It could also be not allowing somebody to practice their religion just because you don't want them to have an outlet. Um, Forcing somebody to practice your religion so that they have to sort of abide by the standards of the religion, you know, that you belong to. And so it can kind of manifest itself in a lot of different ways. So did that make sense? Those different types of abuse? Um, Is there another type of abuse that anybody think can think of that maybe I didn't have like on the list? Was there something on the list that I had that surprised you? That was a type of abuse. No? Some of the financial abuse was a little different. Yeah, you know, I think, you know, from one of the things, you know, from just talking to people, you know, and really, you know, because the thing about it is relationships are really complex, right? And uh, people have a hard time dif- differentiating and, and you're, you know, what is, what is abuse, what is normal and what is not, right? And again, when you're in a relationship, you're going to buy people things, you know, you're going to want people to buy you. I mean, that's just part of being in a relationship. But what makes it abuse is when you feel like if I don't do this, then the person is not going to want to be with me. If I don't do this, then I'm not going to get the affection from the person, you know, that I want. And I'm not talking about, you know, like, you know, okay, I'm going out on a date and I have to pay for dinner. You know what I mean? Kind of thing. You know, I'm talking about situations that you'll see where a person is basically kind of expecting you to kind of fake role their whole life right and the understanding is that you taking care of me and so I'm going to take care of you in the way you want kind of thing right where the relationship is almost it's not a relationship it's almost like a quid pro quo type of thing right where it's like I scratch my back and you know I literally scratch your back kind of thing so And, you know, and you'll see a lot of people, too, in these relationships, well, they'll have more than one, they'll be talking to more than one person for money, too, right? And so they will be misrepresenting themselves to you, making you think you're the only one, you know, making them think that they love you and they care about you so that so that they can get your money. I mean, I've known of people who have literally gone broke, all right, trying to help the person that they love, and it's just all a scam. Right. They're just using them for money, but they're doing it because they love the person and they're afraid if they don't do it, they're going to lose the person. So and I think we don't tend to think of that as abuse, but it is abuse. It is abuse. So and and that's what I mean when I say that oftentimes like abuse doesn't look the way that you think it'll look because we're just so used to thinking of it just in the physical sense. Right. And looking at the bruising that we don't take into account all of the other ways that people can be manipulated and destroyed, right? Beyond, you could be a victim of domestic violence and never, ever, ever have been touched physically. And that's something that I always, always wanna reiterate to people. 
Okay. All right. So I wanted to show this oh, our video's not working. Let's see. Okay, this. All right, I want to go into. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to go to YouTube right quick. <laughs> my video. Pasting. You're describing a song. Can everybody hear that? Okay, perfect. Violence here. And you guys didn't invent it. It's it's very well entrenched. It's it's definitely a, a cycle of violence. And you know, Robin deals with domestic violence all the time. She works with women that are caught in this trap all the time. She's created a whole curriculum about this. And Robin, let's talk about this, if, if you will help me here. Number one, tension building, right? This is when it starts building up and the tension starts to rise, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. You start feeling the tension. There's this, it's in the air. Anxiety starts to build, right? Behavior starts to change. Uh, yes, you can feel it. You can see the the abuser change his behavior in this case uh he starts changing the way he speaks to her starts blaming her for him being so agitated yes right and then number two in the cycle just so we know number two is the incident any type of abuse occurs it might be physical sexual uh, emotional whatever yes sometimes he'll, the, the abuser will have one go-to abuse to start with and then it leads to all the others. But yes, usually okay. they'll have one where he just hits her or starts speaking to her in a derogatory way. And again, like I said, telling her it's her fault. She's And I want to say she's using her, but as I mentioned before, men can be victims as well. That has a problem. All right. And then number three in the cycle is this is... Uh, the making up. This is when they try to undo everything, right? right? Right. I'll never do it again. I'm sorry. Again, you made me do it. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, please forgive me. That'll never happen again. That's not who I am. Okay. And then the fourth, you come around, and then this is the calm after the storm. Right. Then everything is just normal, right? Right. It's right. like it never happened. To show her this is really who I am. I'm not that person. Okay. This is really and quiet. then you go back to number one, tension starts building, right. then the abuse. I mean, it just, it's a circle. It just goes around and around and around. And when you described to me what was going on, and even when he described to me what was going on, this is exactly what you were describing, correct? Correct. Does each of those distinctly happen with you? Yes. So we didn't make this up for you. To, to describe what was happening with you, this was put together uh, based on research across years and years and years of the way abusers interact with their partners. You just happen to fit it like a key in a lock. All right, so this is what Tyrese was talking about earlier when he was talking about sort of kind of the addictive nature of it. it it's sort of the cycle of violence, right? Uh, where you go through phases like it's not all bad right it's just not all crap right um there are times when things are really really good right when things are good when things are great when things feel normal then you go through a tension phase where you start to feel like maybe your partner is getting a little bit agitated and you feel like the abuse is coming on and you're trying to placate them well, one or two things will happen either you'll try to placate them to try to stave off the abuse or sometimes people will even pick fights just to get the abuse over with. Then the abuse happens 
And then uh, there's the devastation of that. And then there's the honeymoon phase where it's like, you know, I'll never do that again. I'm sorry, I'm a changed person. And sometimes these, they don't happen in linear. You could go from the honeymoon phase to the abuse, you know, without the tension building, but in however long, and, and it can take however long it takes, you know, within your relationship, but it, it speaks to sort of the ebbs and the flows of what it's like to be in a DV relationship. It, it's just not, it's not simple and it's not, it's not complicated and it's not one way, right? Did that make sense? All right, so we talked a little bit about why people stay, and I was curious to get your opinions. Why do you think people stay in, in domestic violence relationships? Anybody just have a guess as why they think people stay? Fear, right? Financial gap, fear. Anybody else? Fear, embarrassed, they don't want to be alone. Exactly, right? Sometimes, you know, you feel like um, having somebody's better than having nobody, right? They have nowhere else to go. All right, exactly. These are all fantastic answers, you know, because I cannot, low self-esteem, that's part of it too, right? They've been so beaten down, right? That they don't feel like they deserve any be anything better. And this has become their normal, right? And these are all fantastic answers because I cannot tell you how many people are like, I can't believe so-and-so allowed that to happen to them. If that was me, if somebody looked at me cross-eyed and I'm just like, it's not you, right? It's not you. And they always tell people, um, you know, I have never been in a domestic violence relationship. And I think in a lot of ways, it's kind of helped me kind of talk about it because I understood that it's not something for me to understand, right? It's not something for me. I don't, I cannot understand a person's personal relationship. It's not for me to understand or to judge. It's just for me to help, right? And to be there for someone who's going through it, you know, and to understand that people do have their reasons and their valid reasons. A lot of people have children. They want to keep their family together, right? Um, I know um, Olivia, I hope I'm saying that right, um, ignorance, right? They don't know where, that they, they can leave, right? They've either been told that this is the way life is or they don't know that there's a place that they can go to that can help them. Um, they're embarrassed, right? Oftentimes people have created this facade, right? Of the perfect life and the perfect marriage or the perfect relationship. And to have to go back and say, I'm a victim of domestic violence is, is embarrassing, right? It, it, it breaks the facade. Um, also, I, the fear thing is so important. The most dangerous time for a victim's life is when they leave, all right? The majority of women and men who are victims of domestic violence that are murdered is when they leave. So when you're watching the news, and you see somebody getting shot or kidnapped or they've had acid thrown in their faces and you're like, why didn't they leave? Nine times out of 10, if you're following the story, they have left, all right? And the abuser has decided that this is the only thing that they have left. So when people tell you, Come, sometimes I'm gonna kill you, they mean that. And so that's why we always encourage people to have a safety plan. All right, to, to get themselves in a position where they can leave safely, where they have somewhere to go, somewhere the abuser can't find them because their lives could literally be in danger. And that's something that's important to understand as well. All right, I wanted to show another video um, right quick that speaks to that a little bit. can't believe that they'll say the things that they're saying to you. You can't believe that the person that you... So everyone always wonders, why do domestic violence, violence victims stay? 
why would someone stay in a relationship if they are being physically or verbally abused, right? So there are a number of reasons that someone would want to do something like that. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go over four reasons, right? Four reasons why victims of domestic violence stay. Why do they stay in those relationships? Research shows that over 80% of abusers are men, right? So over 80% of abusers are men. So which means it's not only men are actually committing these types of abuse. There are a significant amount of women who are also abusers as well. But no surprise, you know, over 80% of abusers are men. And a lot, a lot of times, the research also shows that it's a lot of young women are finding themselves in situations where they are the ones that are being abused. So what would cause someone to stay? Because people always wonder, why don't you just leave? Why can't you just walk away? I would never let someone hit me. I would never let someone do this to me or whatever the case is. Why can't you just get up and leave? That seems to be that common idea that a lot of people would have. Surprisingly enough, if you look at a lot of research, a lot of those same people who say that they will just get up and leave if they found themselves in, in an abusive relationship, they don't, right? They actually don't get up and leave. Even very educated people mm -hmm. who would tell themselves that I would never allow this guy to, to beat up on me and stay in a relationship with him, right? Or vice versa. I would never allow this female, this woman to beat up on me and stay in that type of relationship. Or even if it's a same-sex type of relationship, whatever the situation is, they would not allow no. someone to beat up on them and actually stay in that relationship. So even educated people say that as well. And guess what? A lot of them actually do stay. So why do people stay in these relationships? Well, first, they go together. Shame and embarrassment, right? That is one of the number one reasons why people will stay in that type of relationship. Remember, you probably said probably to your friends or your family, that's never going to happen to me. If anyone was to ever verbally or physically abuse me, I'll just walk away. Better than that. And so when it actually happens to some people now, they can't walk away because they are ashamed. They don't want anyone to find out, right? They don't want their family and friends to know that they are allowing someone to abuse them. They're in an abusive, violent relationship, right? So they don't want that person to know. Or they're embarrassed. They're embarrassed for themselves. They're so embarrassed because, again, they can't believe that they allow themselves to get into that situation. So shame and embarrassment, that is number one. Number two is fear. They're absolutely fearful of that person, that they might act if they leave. And, you know, a lot of good uh, researchers and a lot of organizations would tell you that would deal with, with domestic violence would tell you, be careful how you're leaving, um, you know, pack your bag when they're not at home, make, you, make sure you have a plan in place if it's a violent type of relationship and orchestrate you leaving in a certain type of way that you don't get yourself hurt or killed, right? That's actually something that a lot of organizations would tell you uh, that support people who go through those types of abusive relationships. But a lot of people have been told, I will, you know, they, they've told you, I'll kill you if you leave, or said something like that to you. So guess what? A lot of people don't leave, initially at least, because of fear. That's the second reason. The third is they can't believe that they could do better. Now, I've actually talked to several women who've been in abusive relationships and they were convinced that this person had, because they had helped them at some point in time throughout their life, that they deserved, they had a, a weird kind of loyalty to this person, right? And then in, in that loyalty they had to them, because that person helped them 
in some way along the way was also the fact that they didn't believe now that they could do any better in life if they did not have that person. And that's, that's the next thing, right? That's number three. They, they don't believe, uh, someone in an abusive relationship a lot of times don't believe that they could do any better, all right? They can't do better. They have to have this person in their life. They have this, and sometimes it's attached to that weird loyalty they have to them because the person has been good to them in the past to help them accomplish something. Maybe to help you go through school. And so you feel a kind of loyalty to them, even though they're abusing you verbally or physically, there still is, well, you know, he used to help me or she used to help me. So they're beating you or they're verbally abusing you, but in your head, you still have that kind of loyalty. And so that keeps a lot of people trapped in that type of situation. Number four, I can't believe this is what he or she's doing. You actually can't believe that the person is being abusive. You might ask yourself, how can it happen? How can you not believe? Why? Because they were so nice, right? This person was so nice when you met them initially. And a lot of times for a long period of time after that, they've been so nice to you. You can't believe how different they are when they get upset. You can't believe that they'll say the things that they're saying to you. You can't believe that the person that you have fallen in love with is actually beating you. And so there is this whole idea of dealing with the, the reality of what's going on. And then you in this dream world of what used to happen, right? So you're, 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 you're using your past, right? To, to put a shadow over your future and over the reality of what's going on at the moment. So it's, it's one of those things where you just, you just can't believe. And it's like, I can't believe this person is doing, I'm not seeing this. Is this real? Right. And so that's why a lot of people are still caught up in those relationships. And then you start asking yourself, what did I do? Right. What did I do to get, because you can't believe this nice guy is beating you or this nice woman is hitting you or whatever the case is beating you or whatever the situation is. So you know you're asking yourself, what did I do to make this, this nice person, this person that I fell in love with, hit me, abuse me, beat me, whatever the case is, talk to me the way he or she talks to me. I can't believe they're doing it. I must have done something wrong. And so a lot of times people will still be in that relationship trying to figure out what can I fix? What can I do different so that this person will not hit me again? Right? So there are your four reasons. Number one, shame and embarrassment. Shame, you don't want people to find out. Embarrassed, they, they're embarrassed that they allow themselves to be in that situation after saying, that will never happen to me. Right? Number two, fear that how the person will act if they know you're about to leave them or after. As you know, sometimes situations like that can turn out to be very violent. I can't do better. Number three, they can't, they don't believe they could do better. It's also attached to a weird loyalty they have to the person because the person has helped them along the way or helped them with something else in their life. And number four, I can't believe this really nice, handsome, whatever guy or female or whatever the case is, is actually hitting me. I can't believe it. Maybe I did something and I need to change what I'm doing so that I don't get hit again, right? Those are the four... Those are just four reasons, right? And I'll, I'll. All right. So you guys were good. You guys got a lot of the reasons why, like before. Um, any thoughts on that? On what he said? Anybody? Did it make sense? Yeah. Anything that people might want to add? Any reasons you can think of that he didn't touch on that you think were important as to why maybe people people stay? Yeah, Geraldine, thank you. Felicia, thank you. Am I saying your name right, Maliva? Because I would hate to be saying it wrong. Is it right, Maliva? Maleva. Maleva. Thank you. Oh, that's so pretty. Thank you. 
All right. So yeah. So again, like everything, it's 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 complicated. It's not easy. All right. So um, as we work with people who are victims of domestic violence, it's important that we again we focus on being culturally competent. We look at the different norms and values of their culture and we work accordingly. So if you're, if you're dealing with a culture that don't necessarily believe in divorce for whatever reason, your focus is not necessarily shouldn't be on divorce because you know in the beginning it's like, oh, you need to divorce that person or you need to get rid of that person. You know, maybe the focus just needs to be on self and healing and different things like that. As we talked about earlier, if you're dealing with a, um, a culture that is not really big into law enforcement and social services, you know, maybe the answer is not always to lean on them to call the police, right? Or because there might be a fear of that and you need to understand that, right? Um, if you're dealing with someone particularly, um, I, I think you guys probably know that the statistic is higher um, if a police officer were to come into the home and there's a DV situation and there's a parent, a mom of parents of color, um, the statistics show that that child is more taken out the home more often than if a situation happened with their white counterpart. So there's fear like around that as well. And so it's just, you know, um, again, the way that you're working with the domestic violence victim, a lot of times people, we want to get the mental health and they need mental health, but you might be dealing with someone whose culture told them not to believe in mental health, right? That mental health, you know, you're not crazy. You don't need it, different things like that. And so it's just kind of approaching them from there, maybe getting someone to help them that looks like them or getting them to kind of see why the mental health is important and not just kind of judging people because they don't, because a lot of women of color run into this when they go into traditional shelters, they get judged for not acting like a victim, right? If you were in a victim of domestic violence, why are you so tough? You know what I mean? You know, because because we, we want to be strong no matter what in, in any situation. Like if you're a victim of domestic violence, why won't you accept our help and, and go oh, into therapy? <laughs> oh, why won't you accept our help and go into therapy? Um, if this person really abused you, why won't you get this restraining order, right? Without understanding that, we don't want to put he or him or her in jail because we feel like as Black people, as people of color, we already have to deal with the police in that right? We don't want to be a person who puts another person of color in jail. We just want the abuse to stop. So it's understanding the people that you're working with, again, meeting them where they are and giving them the type of services that they want. And finally, what can we do as a community? Understand if there's nothing normal about relationship violence. Um, talk openly about domestic violence. Um, when I first started this work 16 years ago, there was still this belief that domestic violence was personal business or people were still ashamed to talk about it. And now I think people see domestic violence for what it is as a social justice issue. And they understand that if we don't stop the cycle of violence now, it's going to continue to be a generational curse that's going to stop us from being where we need to be. Don't judge people again. I know it's sort of our natural instinct to be like, if that was me, but just understand that it's not you and that people need you to be empathetic. And I always want to talk to people about this because I know a lot of times people who have family members or friends who are victims of domestic violence get incredibly frustrated because they won't leave, right? And they just, and they get to the point where they just want to throw their hands up and be like, you know what, if you like it, I love it. You know, I don't care. And I always tell people that's a natural reaction, but do not do that because when the person is ready to leave, when they get to that seventh time, they're really going to need you. So I always encourage people to sort of step away, if not completely back, and let the person know, you know, that, you know, I'm still here for you. Check on them occasionally. Let them know, you know, that you're still there for them. And also, sometimes as a friend and family member, you need to seek mental health as well, right? Because it's almost like you're going through it. So I don't know if everybody knows this, but a lot of DV organizations offers therapy for people who have family members who are victims of domestic violence. Very similar to Al-Anon for people who have um, friends and relatives who are. Um, in the throes of substance abuse, 
This works just like that. And these classes help you understand domestic violence and help you cope with it as well. You know, how you're feeling about the not being able to kind of intervene because people always ask me, what can I do if I have a friend or family member who's a victim? And I always have to tell them nothing. I mean, until they're ready to leave, they're not going to leave. You just have to be a support system for them in the best way that you can be. Um, encourage victims to take advantage of resources. Again, Genesee, we're here. We've been here for 41 years. Hopefully we'll be here for another 41 years and we are here to help. And then, you know, think about volunteering your time and your services at a domestic violence shelter. Um, domestic violence is not a sexy issue. It's not something people are throwing money at. And a lot of times, you know, we, we need help and services and volunteers and people that can pitch in. So if there's something, you know, that you or someone wants to do or a cause that you feel like you want to be connected to, you know, I would encourage you to, to choose a domestic violence organization because I know we always, um, we always need the help. So thank you. Um, any questions? Any comments? And um, our... I wanted to put our 1-800 number up. Sorry, usually I'm doing the presentations longer. <laughs> um, so um, you can call us at our 1-800 number. Oh, it's not even up on here, I'm sorry. I'm gonna put it in the chat. 1-800-479-7000. Um, Three two eight. Again, that is our 24-hour hotline. Um, somebody will always be there to answer it. And also, I wanted to reiterate, because I'm not sure if I told you guys or it was clear, you don't have to come into the shelter to receive our services. You can be what's called a drop-in client. So if you have someone who doesn't want to come into shelter or if they don't need to come into shelter for whatever reason, they can come call our 1-800 number, request to be a drop-in client, and they'll get all the programs and services as a residential client. So they'll get all the legal services, the mental health services, physical health, vocational education, help with childcare, housing, everything that they need. And again, um, all of our services are free of charge to the clients. Exactly, Geraldine. It is so important to be kind, even if you don't understand it. You know, and you can't understand it. There's nothing logical about somebody staying in a relationship where they're being abused. It's not logical. So you have to take logic out of it, right? Don't try to understand it because I don't even think they understand it. But again, you can be empathetic to that person and you can be there for that person and you can help them, you know, without judgment. So thank you for that. That's so important. Well, right. Angela, thank you so much. Uh, we uh, totally appreciate you taking your evening to explain uh, this. And there, there is, I'm constantly amazed on the information that we get that it may not apply right then, but then we may run into someone later. Like this week, I actually ran into someone that I gave information about um, a father's program. So you never know uh, when this can come in handy. And we truly uh, appreciate you being here. Um, Thank you so I'm much. And again, I'm sorry, but again, not to, but if you, again, if you know any, if you want us Genesee to come out to any of the organizations that you work with to do any type of training around domestic violence, you can just email me here and we'd be more than happy to, to come out and do that. Um, I'd like to know uh, if there's a way uh, we could donate to the show. Oh yeah, that would be great. Um, so are you thinking about what type of donation are you thinking about? Um, I don't know. Um, you know, our church is always... Uh, trying to donate um, clothes or food or, I mean, the services, I don't know, whatever it is. So, so for volunteer services, um, that would be me. So any type of volunteer project that you're thinking about, you can email me and we can definitely discuss that. 
for um, physical donations, I'm going to put Pam Thomas's name in the chat. She um, is the person who facilitates that. And I am going to put her, um, oops, her, um, her email um, address in here as well. So you can reach her. Thank you. Oh, no, thank you for thinking about us. Yeah. And she can definitely facilitate any donations. But again, if you want to do a volunteer project, I, I'm your girl. <laughs> and I just want to remind everyone to uh, put your name and zip code in the chat. Uh, next week, our uh, parent power group is a recruitment and support for foster families. Uh, we had Nancy here before, and there were so many questions, so we're having her uh, come back again. Um, so that is next week. Uh, so uh, once again, before we leave, I uh, want to give you some information on the Green Foundation, Act Now COVID Help. Do you need COVID-19 supports and services? Uh, feel free to scan the code. Or, uh, or if you know someone else who needs those, um, our telephone, the telephone number is 323-229-3411 and the contact is the Green Foundation. So once again, thank you all for being here tonight. I look forward to seeing you guys again and um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for being so, um, just really into the topic and engaged and participating. Um, it just made it a great presentation. Thank you.